In biblical times, pottery was in common use. It was very vital and is important to the culture. Mainly made of clay, it was very fragile, yet durable, could last a very long time. Even ancient sites studied by archaeologists can find pottery today to determine the ethnic, ethnic affinities, determine the age of the culture, maybe some trade connections. There's a lot to learn from the pottery that was found. The one thing is, though, it is very fragile. The rich or upper class would use more metal vases, which were more common. Pottery was very vital to everyday life, including food storage, preparation, <coughs> transportation, cooking and serving. It wasn't like today's society where we break something and throw it away and get something new. That was a very fragile item that was very important to the survival. The Bible also compares people to clay in the hands of a potter in the hands of a potter, as, as in Genesis 2, was man was created from dust. It says in Isaiah 64, verse 8, you don't have to turn there. It says, but now the Lord, you are the father, we are the clay, and you are the potter. And all, we are the work of your hand. So God is shaping each and every one of us according to his purpose and shape thereby sh shaping the church. God has created and shaped each one of us according to his purpose. He has put us in the body of Christ just as he would want us to be put in. Our conversations are the most basic means for communicating and connecting with each other each week. We learn about ourselves. We learn about other people. Communication is very important for our personal relationships and professional relationships as well. We want to be better understood, and we also want to understand others. What's important is good quality communication. It is very critical for a rich personal relationship to grow. It's a learned behavior. Communication is learned from a young baby throughout adolescence into adulthood, and we're still learning good communication skills today. God commands us that we love one another as God loves us. So it's even more critical that we apply good communication each Sabbath in our spiritual families, also important in our natural families, in day-to-day -day meeting people, in the store, at work. Communication is, is essential. We know that we should have good speech that should be gracious and seasoned with salt so that we may know how to answer each person. First, I'd like to mention a, a few poor communication methods that we're to avoid, avoid and get those out of the way. Those are harmful to our relationship with God and rela relationship with our brethren and our family. Have you ever been in a conversation where it kind of went bad, whether it turned into gossip or slandering? How about conversations that turned into a complaint fest? One complaint upon another. Have you ever complained yourself a little bit too much? I know I have. How about speaking out of turn or interrupting somebody in their conversation? We could go on and on about bragging, about being overly opinionated, have an opinion about everything. We all make mistakes, and we're all learning together. Our relationships are vital to us. They're very important, more than anything. So we, don't, we want to have good communication and avoid some of these ways. Gossip can erode the trust we have with one another. Slander can ruin somebody's reputation. Negatively, overly negative um, uh, speech can drive, spark negative emotions in a conversation. It's not that their point isn't true, it's just that it's overwhelmingly negative, and it's always, so everybody gets subjected and sucked into that point of view. Some people try to see the worst in everything. Some people are too critical towards other people. Another example is rudeness. Rudeness is simply ignoring somebody, or maybe 
intentionally undermining them or mocking or teasing them, maybe intentionally or unintentionally. A researcher named Christine Porath published an article in the Harvard Review which surveyed 2,000 people and customers of more than 25 industries globally and said that 73% said it was not unusual for customers to behave badly, up from 61% in 2012. And the last negative uh, attitude perspective is pride. This is probably the most damaging one because pride can cause one to be overprotective and defensive in their relationship. It puts up walls, eventually leading to isolation from others. Pride prevents close personal relationships from growing. We as Christians are to guard our speech against these characteristics of gossip, slander, negativity, rudeness, and pride. Satan is always looking for opportunities to be divisive in our relationships. We should focus on getting our hearts right and our words will follow. How critical is it to get our speech correct? If you turn with me to James chapter 1, verse 26. James chapter 1, verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So we could come on Sabbath day, we could show up for the feast days, we could make friends in the church, but if we have these, we can't bridle our tongue, then we're going to suffer, our religion becomes useless. That's how important it is for us to get our communication as best as we possibly can. We deceive our own heart, as it says here, if we don't get our communication correct and bridle our, our tongue, just like a, a horse would have to bridle, one would bridle a horse's tongue to direct it in the way to go. The important part of this is that we change, that we continue to grow in our communication skills and learn where we made mistakes and where we need to grow. If you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. <coughs> It says on the screen, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness, from one degree of glory to the other. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So if we could see ourselves change and grow, but it's important that we do see ourselves with this unveiled face that we've been given, with the gift of the Holy Spirit. The veil was torn away, and we're able to see more clearly than we did prior to baptism. Now, we can't see everything clearly. We do see through a, dark, a glass darkly. But we do continue to grow and expand our vision of who we are. And it says here, as we're being changed into his likeness, that we're being changed to be more like Jesus Christ. And this is that gift of the Holy Spirit that he give, has given each and every one of us, that we have the ability to transform and grow and to be more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. As I mentioned in the beginning, pottery, that we're being shaped and transformed. I'd like to share a method of one way of transforming pottery is a Japanese practice of kintsuki. Kintsuki, K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I, kintsugi. Kin is gold, and sugi is joinery. So it's translated golden joinery, the art of repairing broken pottery with a lacquered dust mixed with gold, silver, or platinum. The Japanese embrace kintsugi as beautiful statement of restoring broken things, giving them new life. In biblical times, they used staples on the inside to hold the broken pottery together. Sometimes they used wax. Just think how worthless it would be if you can't hold anything in that pottery. The Japanese embraced this is making something more beautiful. In God's loving way, he renews and restores our broken places rather than using the method that just fixes it temporarily. He extends and highlights it with these golden lines, if you can imagine, in that pottery of golden lines traveling through those broken places. He gives those broken areas of our life new beauty and new value. He puts the good things to use when we overcome sin and we overcome our trials, 
Those are the broken ears of our life that he can make good. They become part of our journey, part of our story, and each one has, each one has their own uh, memory. Each, each has their own story that we can learn from each other and, and put, learn to learn to put the past behind and change and grow from those with our good communication. Our story is God working with us during our trials and tribulations to become a brilliant display of God's workmanship and artistry on our life. In order to help us with this transformation process, I'd like to share an acronym with you. The acronym is PATCH, P-A-T-C-H. So each letter will correspond with something that can help us in our daily communication. And perhaps if we take these five words and think of these when we leave our house in the morning and maybe apply these to our daily life, we could have a better effective communication with everyone around us. Now patch is, think about it, it's, a, it's, a, it's to mend or, or to strengthen a weak point, like in a pair of pants. For example, if a jacket was torn, you could put a patch on it and make it new, make it stronger than it even probably was before. As a verb, it's to mend or to strengthen something by putting a piece of material over a cloth or a weak point. This is what God does with us. He mends us, makes us whole. So look at that word again, mend. I love that word, mend. It's to, to free from faults or defects, to make amends or atonement. And here's a few synonyms that I thought were important to kind of see the different characteristics of that word, so many different ways to use it. Mend is to reform, to reform. So we are being reformed. We're to put into good shape or good working order again, to correct, to strengthen by negotiation or reconciliation, or cure, to restore to health before the bone was fully mended, is to make healthy, to make whole. So the first letter is P, for positive. We have a positive attitude each day, a positive in our view of other people, optimistic. We think of the fruit of the spirit, that we're gentle with people, that's very positive, that we're um, encouraging, that we help build each other up. It comes from a standpoint of giving, when you enter a conversation, you want it to come from a standpoint of giving, not one of getting. We want to share an upbeat, positive, happy mood, one that you're there to bring positive energy. Sometimes we have to reframe or recast re something in a different light to make it more positive. We want to use a build up words, <laughs> encouraging words like, I appreciate your honesty. You have the best laugh. You make me smile. Your generosity inspires me. Your positivity inspires me. Your smile is contagious. With complete strangers, to learn to love complete strangers, as well as our family. If you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. This is encouragement. Encouragement says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are. We come from a standpoint of giving, standpoint that we have a lot to offer. We want to offer goodness and gentleness, kindness, and joy. We want to be a positive influence in our conversations. So how does this happen through us? You can found in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Romans 15, verse 4, it says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ had, so that with one mind, one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another just as Jesus Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise to God. 
encouragement is one of the most important themes in the Bible for us to give one another. As we can see, it starts with us reading the Word of God, and digesting it, and processing it, and in integrating it in our own lives, and sharing it with our brothers and sisters in Christ, or share it with people at work. And then they could share that positivity and encouragement with one another. Wherever people are at in life, everybody could use encouragement at some point, especially during their times of trials and their tribulations. It says in Romans 14, 19, that we need to be, make every effort to do what good, to do what leads peace to a mutual edification. This is edification in the New Testament is oikodami, which translate literally as the building of the house. According to the Vine's expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words, the word indicates the promotion of spiritual growth and development of character of believers by teaching, by example, suggesting such spiritual progress as the result of patient labor. So we're to bring hope to one another, maybe hope that we share that we had our prayer answered, or hope for the kingdom of God to come quickly when we see people in strife or pain. Mutual edification involves helping one another along the road to Christ-likeness, and each member, each one of us, has his or her own role to play in preaching the word of God by promoting good conduct and develop Christ-like character. So the first letter is P, positive, with the fruit of the Spirit, with encouragement, edification, and hope. The second letter is A, patch, P-A. A can mean authentic. Authentic means true to one's own personality or spirit or character. It's a sincerity with no pretensions. An authentic Christian, one who is, stands up for their beliefs, their values, they live with integrity. They read the word of God and they do their best to follow it. They mean what they say and they say what they mean. This is what we all strive to do, is that we have our actions line up with our words. We want to be honest. And two ways we could do that is speaking truth and love. In Ephesians 4, chapter 15, it says that we should, instead of instead speaking truth and love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. We're, again, speaking how important it is to speak truth and love when people speak lies or error or negatively, to respond in a positive way that's truthful. Another way we can exemplify authenticity is if our brother or sister sins against us, and that can be found in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out, the, point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. This is so important that we apply our authentic Christian self to our brothers and sisters because we set the standard. We help give an example of what Christ would be like. So the first letter was P for positive. A is for authentic. The third letter is T for timing, being timely. So how can we apply timely to our conversation? Well, timeliness is speaking, knowing when to speak and when not to speak, when it's not your turn not to speak. And this takes wisdom, it takes patience, being timely in your conversation. There are plenty of examples in Proverbs of fools who answer before listening like in Proverbs 18, verse 13. Proverbs 18, verse 13 is to answer before listening. That is folly and shame. This is the, obviously the wrong timing to speak. We want to listen first and answer next. Otherwise, we are foolish and bring a shame to ourselves. Another example in Proverbs is Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28. Proverbs 15, 28, the tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. He just speaks and speaks and opinionate, 
gives opinion after opinion and not hearing, not hearing the truth or the knowledge that's been given. So the third letter is T, timely. I'll be timely in our conversation. The fourth letter is C, connect. I believe this is the most important point of communicating is that we connect with one another, either superficially or deeply. Each person is closer to some people in, in fellowship than others, and that's okay. But we at least want to connect, even on a superficial level. Whether we talk about sports, that's okay. If we talk about the weather, that's okay. But we want to make eye contact with people to show that we're listening, show that we care about them, even on a superficial level, which is very important. Or how about connecting on a deep level with our personal trials, our own struggles? It's important that we connect on the, in every, everything, because we have a lot in common being all children of God. I was supposed to have one like mine, all on the same path, with the same goal and destination. But what's important before we connect with other people is we had that connectedness with God. We need to connect with God first. And I thought a good example of this was found in John chapter 15, verse 5. John chapter 15, verse 5, where he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you could do nothing. So we are totally dependent upon the vine. We are the branches. If you want to change and grow, we must turn to God and ask for help. Ask for that increase in our communication to learn where we need to correct, need to revise, rethink, reconsider, and maybe repent. But this verse certainly describes how we need to be connected to God in order to connect with other people so that we may bear much fruit with kindness and joy, love, peace, patience, goodness, and the purpose is so critical. We all know the purpose is to be more knit together, to be more like Jesus Christ. We collectively are the body of Christ, each individually. As we each one of us build ourselves up with the word of God, we could share that, be closely knit to one another. That could be found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, From him, the whole body, joined and knit together by every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And there's that word again, edifying. We must be joined and knit together, effectively working by which every part does its share. Each one of us has his or her own responsibility to help where they're at, wherever they, whoever they meet within the church. So after P for positivity and authenticity and being timely and being connected, the fifth letter is being humble. Being humble. Humble could be exemplified in conversations by putting other needs first. First, we must find out what those needs are. We might ask questions and learn what the needs are for that week for that month, but it's important that we listen first to help prevent misunderstandings and ensure that all parties are on the same page. We want to reduce misunderstandings when people cannot listen effectively. This is what happens. We want to demonstrate empathy to allow what the other person is feeling and, sim and showcase similar emotions that we connect, that we understand, that we've been there too. We want to build trust with active listening and we rapport in our conversations. As you can imagine, there's many verses about being humble in the Bible. It's one of the most critical characteristics of a Christian should be, as it could be found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. It says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So the key words that we're humble, we're bearing with one another, we have a bond of peace. It 
bearing with means to take responsibility for again and again. The idea is to be continually and patiently enduring, tolerating, and bearing with one another. This is an important expression of love that believers of Christ should have for one another. Another example of not demonstrating humbleness, of maybe pride, is Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2. It says, Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. How about Philippians chapter 2, verse 3? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but lowliness of mind, that we let each esteem others better than himself. So as we carry this word, patch, P-A-T-C-H, through us, first thing in the morning, help me be positive today, God. Help me be authentic in my Christianity. Help me be timely in my conversation. Help me connect with somebody, maybe somebody new. And help me be humble. Then the next day, we could perhaps reflect on the same acronym, patch, and to reflect so we we don't look in that mirror and forget who we are. As it says in James chapter 1, verse 23, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he does, he was. So it's important to reflect. We go back in that mirror, and did we live up to, the, live up to our own standards of, of being more like Christ? so we don't make the same mistakes day after day. Then we want to reconsider. We want to reconsider how good God is and how we should speak if he spoke incorrectly. We, want to, we don't want to be a forgetful hearer of the word, but we want to be a doer of the word. And if necessary, we need to repent the next day. On that next day, we repent. As it says in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that, time, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So why do we need to repent? Because we'll, we will be responsible for every word we speak. As it says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Another way to say it is in the New King James versions. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on that day of judgment of every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. The Greek word for idol is G692 argos, which literally means without work. That is something lacking fruit and utility. Some translate the word as calamitous or calamity or calamities in plural. It's an event causing great and often sudden damage or distress. We would not want to do that to the people we love in our relationships, even unintentionally. So let's review what we talked about today. We've talked about the negative communication skills that we can inherit from the world that's so common today, which includes gossip and slander, negativity, rudeness, and pride. If you think about once we speak this maybe overly negative or something gossipy that we didn't really intend on doing, that kind of opens the door for that person next to us to speak that same way. Those negative words could be very contagious, just as positive words could be very contagious as well. So the few words, the acronym we went over today is P for positive, that we're encouraging and edifying The scriptures provides us encouragement that we might have hope. And then we share that encouragement towards each other, the same that Jesus Christ had. Encouragement is shared in the hopes that will lift somebody's heart toward God. 
Jesus Christ was very encouraging. I just mentioned, I'll just mention a couple where he says to the paralytic in Matthew 9, 2, he says, take courage, your son, your, your sins are forgiven. Take courage. And he says, take courage, my son. Even though he's a paralytic, he didn't say to a paralytic or depressed person or individual or beggar. He said, rather, he says, a son, take courage. How about the lady that had the 12 years, I think, of bleeding? The do- he says to her, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. And to all of us, he says, with, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. A good example of someone who is encouraging others is in the Bible. You might want to study is Barnabas. Second letter after P for positivity is being authentic, being genuine and real. We stand up for what we believe in. We don't back down. We say things in a way that speak truth and love. We're honest in our faith. The third letter is T, being timely, knowing when to speak and when not to speak, using wisdom. The fifth letter is H, being humble, putting others' needs first, finding out those needs and addressing them. We're quick to listen and ask questions and slow to speak. The beauty and power of Jesus Christ is revealed through each one of us in our speech and our conduct. If we let him through in our lives and be receptive to him and stay connected with him, this is a very powerful ability that you and I have that the world does not have. Our final verse could be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. But he said to me, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast and all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He's working us, with us, changing us, transforming us into the people that he wants us to be, either a son or daughter of God. It's through the healing of them that the world will see Jesus Christ. Christ binds our brokenness and redeems our lives. Just as that shimmery gold that binds that broken pottery gives beauty and new worth to that pottery, Christ binds our broken, brokenness and redeems our lives with his blood. We've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit within our pottery, within our own selves. It's his strength that we rely on, and we share his beauty through our path, this path of the goal that transverses through us, exemplified in the pottery, demonstrating newness of life. Brethren, let us walk away this Sabbath with a new awareness and ability to connect with one another, vowing to recommit ourselves to having wholesome talk as we are called to be the salt of the earth. Have a blessed Sabbath.